I want to talk today about a God who can handle any problem that we may have and any problem that we may give him. A God of grace who will handle every situation that we go through in life with grace and love and infinite kindness. I decided today I would talk for the first time in 42 years about uh, the A word. (laughs) I won't even tell you what the A word is. I'll let you guess it as I go through. The A word is something that greatly divides a lot of people, and there's information that people do not have concerning the uh, situation with the A word that um, I think would be comforting and encouraging to people. So I I decided to talk about it. My source today is both, um, well, it's the, uh, it's the teachings of our Lord, as well as what we may know about God's work through um, religious experience, through the direct experience of God and God's grace. The... Um, The scripture today is just a simple word from our Lord. If you wonder, I'm looking for something, and uh, if I find it, fine. If I don't find it, that's okay too, and I didn't find it, so I'll just quote that scripture. Do not fear those who can only kill the body. Fear the one who can destroy body and soul in hell. Now when our Lord says destroy, he did not mean that a person would cease to exist, but anybody in hell will suffer. And here's the interesting thing that I know about hell both because of the kindness of Lord Jesus Christ and because the first place he went after dying on the cross, uh, a little book in the Bible tells us, was to hell to minister to those who were held there. And that ministry in hell has continued all of these years and it will continue forever. And the only thing that keeps anybody in hell is just the refusal to accept God's love, and to leave there. But I'm not talking about hell today. I'm talking about that first line, don't worry about those who can kill the body because that's all they can do to you and it won't really hurt you all that much. (laughs) In spite of the fact that we work very hard to make sure nobody kills the body because we think we need it. Well, we we, we do need it in this world, but all of our life is not confined to this world. You know, there's something interesting about uh, materialists, materialists. Now, we think about materialists as somebody who is interested in having a closet full of clothes and a car in the driveway, fancy car. But that's not the way, uh, like, philosophers use materialists. Materialists are also called physicalists who believe that all we have is this physical body. That's all you got. And if you lose that, you gone. Well, that's not what our Lord says. That's not what the Apostle Paul says, who says if there is a physical body, there's also a spiritual body, there is a soul. It's interesting. There is a way in which uh, atheistic uh, people who believe that this is all there is, and uh, conservative Christians who insist that the soul life begins at conception, they actually agree with each other. One of them thinks the soul begins when we are conceived, and the other one thinks that life begins when we are conceived and there is no soul, but they are both in agreement about when it begins, but this is not what religious experience tells us. 
Religious experience tells us, and I think this is hinted at at some things in the New Testament, tells us that we actually are... um, I was looking at a cup at my house the other day, and it was an old cup. And it said on the bottom, made in, guess where? China. Of course it was. (laughs) Well, we're not made in China. We're not made in America. We're not made in Texas. All of us were made in the same place. We're made in heaven. We have some life in heaven before we get here. In fact, one of my favorite stories is about a doctor who was talking to to a little girl, uh, nine years old, who had nearly drowned. And he said she was the sickest child he's ever known in his whole life. And when there was a procedure that was uh, des- that they worked on her to try to get her over this nearly drowning and this this uh, close call with death uh, that he thought the family would not like to see because it was invasive. And he asked them if they wanted to leave the room. They said, no, we don't want to leave the room. And they formed a prayer circle around the child's bed which tells you where the family was in relationship to God. And the little girl uh, seemed to be back to her full self, and the doctor was wondering what had happened when she died. How did it happen? And he said, will you tell me about it? She said, oh, you mean when I saw the Heavenly Father in Jesus? (laughs) He had never heard anything like this before. In fact, at that time, he knew nothing about near-death experiences. He said, and he got very excited. And he said, yes, (laughs) tell tell me about the time you saw the Heavenly Father and Jesus. But he scared her, and she wouldn't talk anymore. He came back the next day and took a more gentle approach and said, would you like to tell me about the time you saw Heavenly Father and Jesus? She said, yes. She said, first of all, When I drowned, I just saw complete darkness, and then there was a tunnel, and there was this beautiful woman named Elizabeth, and Elizabeth came through that tunnel. She was very tall, and she had golden hair, and Elizabeth took me back up through that tunnel, and she said, there, I met my my granddaddy, who is dead, and she said, I met the Heavenly Father, and I met Jesus. Well, she also met some other folks, and she met two kids whose name were Mark and Andy. And she said they were waiting to be born. That would make them souls who were waiting to be born. Now, why Mark and Andy had names already, I don't know. But anyway, she had the greatest time with Mark and Andy. And uh, finally, though, the Heavenly Father said, Honey, don't you want to go back to your home? (laughs) She said, No, I want to stay here. I'm playing with Mark and Andy. And the Heavenly Father showed her her mother in this world. Heavenly Father can be sneaky. And she said, yes, I want to go back to my mama. And so she was back. But for that whole first week, as she was getting better and better, she was asking about Mark and Andy. Where are my friends? Some people actually retain some memory of their life before birth. Now, remember what I'm telling us is that we're made in heaven and we come here. We are all incarnate, which means we come into the flesh, all right? We don't grow out of it. We don't grow out of that union of sperm and egg or whatever, okay? If that's all that happened, we wouldn't be here. It takes another act where God implants in that physical creature, our soul. We don't know when that happens. 
probably happens sometime after the brain is at a point where it can accommodate, conserve us. And by the way, we know a lot more before we come into this world because a brain kind of closes things down. We are a thinking person before we are born, and then we're in this world, and our brain doesn't work too well, and we have to learn everything all over again. That's the way God planned it. PMH Atwater tells this story. It's an unusual story, but I actually believe it. She was talking about children who have memories from before they were born. This child said to his mama, the child was about three and a half years old, he said, Mama, do you remember the first time I was in your belly? Mama was shocked. She had been pregnant before and had given birth to a stillborn little girl. And the child said, I backed out. I didn't want to be a girl. I suspect that people who have an identity already, male or female, that has stuck with them, this is one of the things that may cause the confusion in the lives of transgender people that we need to be very sympathetic about. She had never told the child that she had given birth to a stillborn baby. So this was really shocking to Mama. It's interesting, though, that God is not shocked by anything. Any child that is lost before birth or shortly after birth, I believe they're going to have another chance in this world as this boy born to the same Mama, but as a boy instead of a girl. I think that's the way it works. But the soul itself is indestructible. And the death of an infant, the death of anybody, is never, is never a difficulty for God. And all of us at all times are safe in His grace. Whatever time we may leave this world to go to Him. And if it is God's intention that a soul come into this world so that we may grow in grace and understanding, which is our purpose here, and grow in freedom, which is our purpose here, to freely choose God, as the Apostle Paul tells us. We're put here to feel around and seek for God. If it is God's intention that we do that, it's going to happen. Either on the first try or another one. Because that is God's intention in our lives. Sophie was a young woman, 27 years old. She was a graduate student in social work. And she was seeing a guy. And... Uh, she turned up pregnant. The month had been one of the most stressful in all of my 27 years, Sophie said. I had discovered that I was unintentionally pregnant at the same time I had realized the man I was involved with was cruel. I knew with total certainty that I did not want to share a parenting experience with him. She did not want him, the cruel man, to be the father of her child. I felt unprepared for motherhood, smack in the middle of a graduate program that was at the beginning of a career. So I researched my options and made an appointment for an abortion. As the day for the procedure drew near, I became more and more upset. Part of me believed that 
abortion is murder. Part of me believed that abortion is a woman's right. I had been a clear supporter of the choice for women for years. But the part of me that wondered whether I would be committing a murder was horrified by my decision. For us to understand the rest of this story, which I will share in just a moment, we have to know something. God not only loves us, hears us when we pray, God can also communicate with us. God can speak to us, sometimes in words, sometimes in knowledge that is just put into our heads. But God can speak to us. I found this out, as all of you know, because I've told it so many times, when I was 14. And after a prayer, I said, nobody heard me. And then the voice came and said, I heard you. I have known ever since then that God can speak to us. And when we are most lost and most desperate and most in need from time to time, God does because God loves us. And God wants us to know that we are loved. And God wants us to know that we cannot have a problem that God cannot solve. We are never outside of God's grace. On the evening before the scheduled abortion, I was driving my car in the city and I began to cry. I had not been able to let down like this and the grief just poured out of me. I did not know what to do. I had never felt myself so torn by a decision, had never felt before the weight of a life in my hands, I was in a state of other surrender and helplessness. I sobbed. I realized that I might hurt somebody by driving and crying so hard, so I pulled the car over and parked. I sobbed for a long while. Finally, I opened my eyes, and the whole car was filled with golden light, so bright that it should have blinded me, but it didn't. I had no sense of my body sitting in that seat, my hair touching my face, my hands on the steering wheel. It was as if I was not even a physical being anymore. I felt that I was all spirit. I rested, stunned in this light and felt total, with all capital letters, T-O-T-A-L, peace and love, beyond anything I had ever imagined. Remember Paul's joy that passeth all understanding. I heard a male voice with total compassion and clarity. It said, as if from the air around me, as if from the light that surrounded me, Sophie, hear these words, Sophie, the baby will be fine either way. The baby will be fine either way. What you need to know is that the love you are receiving is only the love that you are letting in. There's a whole world of love for you. You're letting in only what you think you deserve. Let the love in. And she capitalizes that word love because God is love. I assume she went ahead with her procedure. 
the Lord God seemed to give her permission because she belonged to God. The baby that was forming in her womb belonged to God. And if it was God's intention that that soul have a life in this world, and it obviously was, then that child would have a life in this world. Some people think that this kind of situation presents a great problem for God. We sorrow over these situations. They are anguishing for moms, for families, especially though for the mom, anguishing. But they're not a problem for God. And I repeat that word to you and let it live in your heart. The baby will be fine either way. God will see to that. Now, what's your problem? The one that seems so big. <laughs> I'd be standing up if I didn't have a problem. When I'm trying to get around, it seems so big. I like to remember there's a whole world of love out there for me and for you. And we're only letting in a little bit sit down sometimes and deliberately say to God, I want to let in more. Let me know you're there. Let me know that whatever problem I am facing, it's not a problem for you. Why? Because God loves us and cares for us. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we so often underestimate the power of your love and the power of your grace to make a way for us in this world where it seems there is no way. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus Christ, be with us, encourage us, encourage all who are hurting today, encourage those who are ill, and remind them that they are held firmly, lovingly in your hands. In this moment now, gracious God, help us to release ourselves completely and totally into your care. In Jesus' name, amen.